Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here. Happy Friday. We're doing another live episode here to round out the week. Uh, and today we're talking about Tesla extending the estimated delivery wait times in China. We'll talk about what those look like for the Model 3 and the Model Y. We've got an interesting report on yield for the 4680 batteries. Uh, we've got a comment from Elon Musk on the LFP, lithium iron phosphate batteries that we talked about yesterday. Rivian, some news on an IPO there, an update from Waymo. Uh, and then at the end, Tesla Daily is now four years old, so I just want to take a couple of seconds to uh, be self-centered for a second and reflect a little bit on that. So uh, we'll wrap up the week with, with that. Uh, but first off, I just wanted to just make a comment because we talked about it yesterday on the Fed Chairman Jerome Powell update today. So here, um, as you can see in the markets today, obviously the NASDAQ and, and Tesla have performed pretty well. Uh, despite the that meeting this morning. So there were some mixed comments, but the market does seem to be reacting relatively positively. Uh, I would say the mixed comments have just kind of been a continuation of what we have seen. So <laughs> yeah, kind of is what it is. The market was not too bothered by it uh, this morning, though. So just wanted to round that topic out. Uh, getting into Tesla-specific news, though. So first thing here to talk about is wait times in China. So we've been talking about this for I don't know, three or four months now. Uh, and the wait times have been pretty short, one to three weeks in general, have been the estimates across various trims for Model Y and Model 3. Uh, and today those have finally increased a bit. So the Model 3 now sits at an estimated delivery of four to six weeks for the standard range. And then the performance also showing four to six weeks. And then for the Model Y, uh, we're actually seeing six to 10 weeks on the standard range. So previously that had just said deliveries begin in August. Obviously, we talked yesterday about how those have started, um, but yeah, now we're seeing an actual estimated delivery time of six to 10 weeks for, for that version. Uh, the long range version, it says estimated delivery date fourth quarter, so I think we're about five weeks out from the start of fourth quarter now, um, and obviously that could run all the way through you know, 18 weeks, essentially. So we've got um, a pretty wide range there on the long range Model Y, and then for performance, it says delivery is expected to begin in the third quarter. So kind of all over the place here, but the important thing is that, at least to me, is that these wait times are now showing a little bit longer. Obviously, part of that, a big part of that is being driven by Tesla choosing to export more vehicles. So it doesn't necessarily tell us a whole lot about the situation directly, domestically in China. Um, but I'd rather see these longer wait times knowing the export situation than still having really short wait times, also knowing the export situation. So I'm happy to see that. Um, those wait times increasing in China, obviously, you know, the more the production can catch up with that, the better, but uh, Tesla seeming to be pretty con production constrained uh, worldwide right now. All right, next up here, we got a report. This was uh, reported by Galley over at Hyperchange. So he put out a video yesterday. You guys can check it out. There are a few interesting comments in there, but one of the most interesting ones was that he said a source has told him that the current yield for 4680 cell production that Tesla is getting is about 70 to 80%. So basically 30 to 20%, 20 to 30% of the batteries that they produce, uh, they're not actually able to utilize. Those can just be recycled and um, hopefully go right back in and actually get a, an actual 4680 cell that is functional um, after that process. But obviously that's more costly, takes more time, et cetera. So looks like about 78%. I've seen reports that in general, Tesla's yield, let's say out of Giga Nevada for the 2170s, somewhere around like 95%. Uh, so definitely some catching up here to do, but getting to the point where it might start to be, you know, feasible for Tesla to actually start scaling this up. Um, and then obviously they talked on the Q2 call about just some of the challenges in the engineering that needs to be solved to make sure that, you know, the equipment can produce enough of these regardless of the yield. Uh, you don't want the equipment to actually break down. So still challenges. Sounds like Galley was saying they're still probably about six months out. Obviously that timeline uh, can change. We heard Elon previously say 12 to 18 months for volume production. I think that was back in April. Um, so it's still going to be some time, but it looks like progress is being made, which is good. Next here, just a continuation of a comment from yesterday. So we talked about the lithium iron phosphate going into the standard range Model 3s in the United States. Elon here just replying to a tweet about that saying, quote, our intent with this pack is that product experience is roughly equivalent between nickel and iron. I'd personally slightly opt for iron pack as it wants to be charged to 100%, whereas nickel prefers about 90%. End quote. So this is something I just meant to I meant to mention yesterday. Um, we've talked about it in the past, but Tesla recommends, or I guess doesn't not recommend, uh, charging to 100% like on a daily basis, like they do for the um, the nickel-based packs. 
So just in terms of the degradation that that causes, it's less impactful for lithium iron phosphate. Uh, so even though the range is a bit lower at 253 versus 263 for the nickel-based pack in the standard range Model 3, it's not as crippling because you're able to charge to 100% uh, more frequently. That said, you know, I don't know that it really makes a ton of difference because the amount of times that you want to charge to 100% I think are pretty rare. So because they're pretty rare, it shouldn't actually hurt your nickel base pack too much to do that when you need to. So personally, I'd still probably opt for the nickel pack, but um, I think they're both, you know, pretty viable. So that was kind of most of the Tesla stuff today, uh, relatively light news day, and we are recording a little bit earlier today just because I have uh, some, some event tonight that I have to go to. Um, but in terms of non-Tesla specific stuff, so we got news today that Rivian has filed for an IPO, Bloomberg reporting this, and they're apparently looking for a valuation of around 80 billion. I think last reports were that they raised at around, you know, 27 and a half billion post money valuation. So I think, you know, this would be a, a big spike in their valuation. I was expecting them to IPO maybe more around 50. Uh, so this was surprisingly high to me. Not necessarily all that surprising, I guess, given the context of, of the market in general um, and valuations for companies like Lucid and things like that. So uh, still a pretty staggeringly high number for a company with, you know, no revenue at this point. Um, obviously a, a big backlog of orders, but comes down to if they can produce and deliver those and uh, continue growing over time. So we'll see. I probably wouldn't be in the, at that valuation. You know, who knows? Things could change, but I would rather rather have my money in Tesla at, you know, 700 billion or whatever than uh, Rivian at 80. All right, next up here. So just a quick update on Waymo. Um, I think this was reported originally by Reuters. Uh, but Waymo will stop selling its self-driving LiDAR sensors to other companies. So originally Waymo had had the thought of, okay, we can lower the cost of producing LiDAR if we're able to leverage our production and sell that to other companies. Uh, they went down that path a couple years back and already now they're, they're changing course. Obviously there have been changes in management at Waymo, so not necessarily super surprising to see a change in course, but um, yeah, I mean, Elon has said, you know, eventually all these companies are going to drop LiDAR and that's not what this is very specifically. That's not this, but um, maybe just a slight step in that direction. Obviously, LiDAR has other use cases, so it's not I wouldn't make an overarching blanket statement right that, but interesting to see um, nonetheless. So I think those were uh, the main things here. Um, and then, as I said, at the opening, so we're actually a week, <laughs> a week past this, but Last week, August 20th, Tesla Daily turned four years old, so four-year anniversary of the first Tesla Daily podcast. I feel like someday we should just sit down and do a live stream and listen to, all, <laughs> to that first episode together. It's changed a lot, um, but hopefully the original premise of just trying to get more good information out to more people has stayed the same. That's really been you know, my guiding principle since the start. Um, so I started it four years ago. Two years ago, took it full-time with just the help of you know, tremendous listeners uh, supporting on Patreon and um, sharing the content and things like that. I'm just so lucky to have the audience that I have here that has enabled that. And as I've always said, you know, I'm trying to use this as a base to build something more. Um, I love doing Tesla daily, but at the same time, like, I don't want to just necessarily sit here and, and create YouTube videos every single day for, for the rest of forever. And hopefully you guys want me to do more than that too. So um, yeah, this was just the original post that I wrote back when I uh, decided to quit my job uh, that I'd been in seven years uh, to focus on, you know, Tesla daily and hopefully growing this into something more. Um, as I said at that time, the goal was to make this more consistent. So over the last year um, I've done, I checked my YouTube numbers and I was actually surprised by this. I've done 268 videos over the last year there are about 260 weekdays in the year, so I'm actually overproducing. <laughs> Not counting weekends, obviously, um, but I'm really happy with the consistency that I've been able to, to bring. Um, and yeah, just a couple of other metrics here that uh, stuck out to me. So the channel now has 31 million views. Uh, really the point of adding YouTube to the podcast was to grow the listener base to try and get the, this information out to more people. Um, we definitely have achieved that. So. Again, I just want to say thank you for those of you that believed in this to allow me to do that, to allow me to have the time to actually do videos, 
to be able to afford to bring um, our editor Jassim on. He's been super helpful with the channel, so a huge shout out to him um, as well. Um, <laughs> and another stat that I just wanted to share, there's 4.2 million watch hours collectively amongst the audience. So it's a 480 years that <laughs> we all have collectively spent watching uh, Tesla Daily on YouTube. So it's just kind of cool uh, to see the impact that I think this has had. And, you know, as I said in this original post, like I want us to continue to make a bigger impact. And I'm working on things behind the scenes, uh, which I'm super excited to share. I'm not ready to fully talk about those yet, but uh, Tesla Daily is not the only thing that I work on. There are other things going on and I'm extremely, extremely excited to um, bring those to you guys. I think this is gonna be the biggest year ever, you know, as we head into year five, this will be. Uh, this is definitely gonna be hopefully another inflection point in Tesla Daily, just like when we um, started YouTube a couple years back. So I'm extremely excited for this. Um, you know, I hope I've shown that over the last couple of years that, you know, I really, I said here in this post, I want to bring the same rational, authentic, anti-sensational, anti-clickbait mindset that I approach the podcast to a broader audience through more mediums. Um, you know, that's, I hope that I have delivered on that. I hope that I've stayed true to my word on that. I really think that I have. And um, yeah, I just want to continue to do that, continue to reward you guys for listening and supporting. Um, when I think about my Patreon audience, that really, I view those, everyone here is a stakeholder, but especially those Patreon supporters, I really want to make sure that those people are getting a good return on their money because there's no reason to support, like they don't get anything extra for supporting on Patreon, but they do it anyway because they know, they put their trust in me to provide good information. Uh, and I really hope that I do that and I hope that I get them a good return uh, on that money. So yeah, I just, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm super excited about what the next year is gonna bring for both Tesla and for the things that I'm working on. And I can't wait to share more of that with you guys um, in the next few months. So super excited about it. I'm sure there's some chats coming in here. Uh, so I do just wanna take a second to, to look at those. Um, I did get a question yesterday too about just um, that I actually missed in a super chat. So I did wanna quickly address that. I always try to address those. Um, I only saw the first part of it. So Peter here yesterday asked, do you feel this Tesla share price is being suppressed in a way similar to 2014 to 2019? Obviously a much shorter time frame at this point. So there are always different forces at play in the stock market. Um, I think one part of that is how the options market affects the underlying stock. Just from when purchases happen, there needs to be something on the other end of that that hedges against that purchase. Uh, so the options market definitely influences Tesla. And then in the past, during this period of time, um, short interest definitely had a huge impact. Tesla was heavily shorted. It's much less heavily shorted these days. Uh, so I don't feel it's suppressed as much from short interest, uh, but I do feel like certain things do influence the stock, such as media coverage um, and such as those option market things that are kind of always going on. Um, so that's my thought on that. Uh, thanks for that question, Peter. And then just let me quick check here uh, if there were any other questions that came in. Um, appreciate the super chats for you guys. I, I really do appreciate those. Um, and as I said, the Patreon support. Patreon's actually a little bit better of a way to support just because YouTube kind of takes a, a cut of those uh, super chats. I gotta throw this, this chat from Joel on uh, the screen here. So Joel's been there since pretty much day one. He was the first gold level supporter uh, for Tesla Daily on Patreon. So just always, always happy to see that from Joel. Um, yeah, that's a, it's a long standing, long standing support. Uh, thank you, Alan or Aline. Appreciate that. All right, guys. Um, anyway, I know this is a little bit of a I don't, I don't know if self-centered is like the right way to put it, but self-reflective episode, not necessarily as Tesla focused, but appreciate all of you. Um, as always, thanks for listening. Uh, make sure you're subscribed, signed up for notifications. If you do want to support on Patreon, you can find that page at patreon.com slash Tesla daily podcast. Uh, and I'll see you tomorrow. Nope. <laughs> Hopefully I won't see you tomorrow unless there's something crazy that happens, but I'll see you on Monday for the Monday, August 30th episode of Tesla Daily almost into the last month of Q3. So 
it's going to be an exciting time period here to uh to continue following tesla but thanks everybody have a great weekend and i'll see you next week thanks